If you would love to create a transformational and successful coaching business, but you don't know where to start or how to make this a full-time career, then my new certification program, Influential Coach, is for you. There is no other four-month live online mastermind like this. I'm going all in, guns blazing on this one with you to skyrocket your coaching career and personal brand online. You will learn the frameworks I personally use for rapid transformational coaching so you can support your clients to achieve their dreams no matter where they are in life. You will also learn how to authentically brand and market yourself as a coach so you can stand out from the rest and build a career of freedom and fulfillment. Spots are limited and this is an application only program. So if you're serious about finally committing to building a successful career in transformational coaching, then head over to imjoelbrown.com slash coach and apply today. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready to meet a true icon in the real estate industry. We have Mr. Dave Eliniger, who is a co-founder and chairman of Remax. Uh, if you don't know Remax, wow, it's one of the biggest real estate companies in the world that have over 125,000 sales agents in more than 100 countries. No matter where you are in the world, I'm sure you've seen the Remax sign somewhere. Uh, Dave and his wife, Gail, revolutionized the industry with the Remax business model, which combines a maximum commission concept with world-class support services for realtors. With over five decades of experience in real estate and franchising, Dave is a highly respected industry expert who has been recognized by Entrepreneur, Forbes, Fortune, Inc., all of the big publications out there. He doesn't have to pay for it. He gets asked to be on it, <laughs> you know, because a lot of people like to pay for these things nowadays. So Dave is very well respected in the space and his entrepreneurial spirit actually doesn't just stop there. Dave is a serial entrepreneur who has owned and invested in a myriad of businesses from travel agencies to NASCAR race teams. And he's even taken a helium balloon expedition out there and uh, attempted his uh, his way to space as well, which is huge. Wow. You must have so much courage, Dave. Despite facing a life-threatening MRSA infection that left him paralyzed, Dave's determination and resilience led him to write the New York Times bestselling book, My Next Step. And he continues to lead the company as chairman of the board. And if that's not impressive enough, Dave is currently writing his next book. He's almost finished. Uh, the book here is called The Perfect 10, which is 10 leadership principles to achieve true independence, extreme wealth, and huge success. And this is coming out January 2024. So grab hold of your seats. Let's dive into it. Dave Liniger, thank you for being here with us today. Good morning. Thank you. Yes, so exciting stuff. You've, you've, like I just really broke the bio down into a little bit of a nutshell, but you have so many things that you've achieved. And as I was reading through it, I thought to myself, wow, if I could say that I've done that many things in my life and kicked that many goals, I'd be pretty happy with myself. It's so, been quite an adventure. If you could, yeah, if you could like maybe encapsulate it into like one word, how would you describe your life? I would say the word adventure. Adventure. All right. Would you say that's your top value? I would think so. Yeah. Um, a lot of people talk adventure being flying airplanes, jet planes, scuba diving, skydiving, uh, doing safaris, whatever it might be. Uh, I've done all those things and done them well. But the biggest adventure of all is taking an idea, no money, and no partners and starting out with one real estate agent and ending up with a hundred and some countries 50 years later. Wow. That's insane. What do you think is the biggest driver for you when it comes to this? Because obviously you have the idea, you got to work your way to execution. Did you feel like there was something pulling you? Was there this big like end result that you focused your mind on? Was there some sort of vision that you made vivid that you just latched onto? What was it for you? Well, for me, it was a cause. Uh, when we created the Remax concept, uh, I wanted to benefit the Remax uh, broker and also uh, help the agent succeed much better than they could anyplace else. <laughs> the way the commissions were split between brokerages and agents back in the early 1970s was a 50% commission split. 
The agent kept their 50% to have their earnings and pay their personal expenses like an automobile, uh, entertainment, health insurance, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The company used their half of the commission, mm -hmm. <laughs> paid the overhead, secretary, advertising, signs, et cetera. Um, there was tremendous turnover because nine out of 10 people that get a real estate license don't have it. Two years later, they give up. It's mm -hmm. a very difficult business to get started in. Uh, there's no salaries, no advances. And so waiting between long time periods to get your first commission check is that really stops people from making a success of it. <laughs> the better you are, the more you start wondering, why am I giving half my commission to my office? I'm doing all the work and I'm looking, putting in all the hours. So we came up with a concept like a co-op, like a group of doctors, lawyers, architects, dentists, that would share the office expenses of running this the particular company and keep the majority of the fees for themselves. So it had a self-cleansing effect that a beginner couldn't come to work for us because not only were they working without any commissions for a long time, they had to pay in advance every month their own business expenses. Mm -hmm. And so it was very difficult to get through. Industry did not like it. It was a terrible threat to established companies because if it worked, they were going to have to pay their agents a lot more than 50% commission. And uh, so we struggled. I made a lot of management mistakes. It was my fault. Uh, I was uh, very naive. And uh, we just had the stick to it of us to make it work. And within five years, we were the number one real estate company in the state of Colorado. Our agents were the highest earning and they made the most money. And all of a sudden the floodgates open and hundreds and hundreds of agents joined us. And then we started franchising and taking it first across the United States, then across the world. Wow. I love this. So, what would you say is a principle or a, a perspective that we can hold if we want to go from not just big success, but huge success? Because this is mentioned in your book title, in, this, in the uh, Subtitle of your book title, Huge Success. And it always makes me wonder, you know, when somebody conquers a goal, sometimes they'll celebrate or they'll say, yeah, that's awesome. I'm great and happy with my accomplishment. And they'll do something else, but they won't cast another vision that's even bigger that gets them excited. Is there anything that you did every time you made that big achievement? Did you always have like a 10-year vision ahead of you or a 50-year vision? What was it for you that was driving you to continue to level up? Well, the drive was to be the biggest and best in the world in my industry. And uh, that seems far-fetched, starting with one agent in 1973. Um, but you have to think big, and you have to dream big. And you're better to shoot for the stars and miss and maybe hit the moon than you are to just drudge along and not have any real goals at all. Uh, I think one of the most interesting aspects of the REMAX success story, uh, we used to claim was it was because of the quality of our people. Our agents outproduce the competition two or three to one. Uh, their earnings are much better. Uh, our experience level is twice the experience of most full-time agents. And so we have this tremendous pool of talent. And so we kept saying for 50 years, the reason we're successful is the talent of the agents. We came to think about it though, and you have to understand in this 50 year journey, I've lived through nine presidencies in the United States. A couple were geniuses, a couple were out and out crooks, and a couple were pretty stupid, but <laughs> we made money all 50 years. Uh, yeah. We went through eight recessions and we made money in every recession except for one. Uh, we lost, uh, we've actually made money. We lost some agents, but the truth of the matter is, if you think back on Darwin's theory, you'll often hear people say, Darwin said the strongest of the species survives. That's incorrect. He never said that. Uh, after all, if you look, uh, the dinosaurs were the strongest of the species and they disappeared and mosquitoes still here hundreds of millions of years later. And so what he really said was the most adaptable of the species survives. And so when you look at the quality of the agents, it was actually the adaptability of the agents to take on the challenges 
of a changing industry, a changing economy, and adapt in such ways that they could continue to be successful instead of staying in the same old groove that they were stuck with in the first place. So embracing change and not being afraid of change is a cornerstone of anybody's big, big success. Yeah, it sounds like you've got to be able to think quick on your feet and to also have the courage to take risks when other people are holding back, right? That's you, correct. Would you say that we're in a recession right now? Like when you look at the economy, or do you think that a lot of this is just fear mongering and, and manipulation in the in the markets? Well, the actual definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've actually seen that uh, because of an unreal event of putting billions, trillions of dollars into the market over COVID and giving everybody extra money and so on. It's just been blanketed a little bit. But we are skyrocketing in our uh, nation's debt and in the over $30 trillion now. And so it's basically, uh, I think the recession is inevitable. Uh, I don't think it's going to be very long. I don't think it's going to be very deep uh, it'd be adjustment. Uh, but it's another one of those things that you better adapt to. Mm. So what can we do to prepare then? Let's talk about this because you've been through multiple recessions. What sort of mind frame would uh, a smart entrepreneur hold? Let's say they start noticing that they're not getting as many leads and customers coming through. They can't expand right now. Where would you start focusing? Would you cut costs on things or would you double down on sales? Would you actively become more resourceful? What are some things that you would mention that you feel would be very powerful for someone to focus on? Uh, Joel, let me give you a little background. Um, there's a fellow by the name of Schwartz who wrote several books 50 years ago or more. And one of them was the magic of thinking big. And there was an interesting paragraph early in the book that I took to heart and I copied it down. I put it on a plaque on my office and it was the theory of more basically says, um, progressive doctor, progressive, try it again. Progressive uh, farmers will try to find a way to get more bushels per acre, more eggs per hen, more pound per cow. Uh, manufacturers will try to figure out how to produce more widgets with less waste. Uh, and so when people think of recession, the first thing that comes about is cut costs, lay people off, mm -hmm. uh, get your budget under control. And in reality, that might be necessary because often businesses do get pretty fat. And when things cause pressure, it makes you look at your business more carefully and say, that really isn't necessary anymore. We're just spending money. So, uh, but that's a knee jerk reaction. You should be looking at your balance sheet all the time. Am I running a, a good, lean, efficient machine? And am I letting excesses get out of the way because the market's so good? Uh, but you balance that off with, uh, if the market's bad, it's bad for everybody then what can you do to take advantage of it? And what can you do to take market share away from other people that are not making good changes? And mm -hmm. so this theory of more is, how do you get more done with less? And that's the demand that's being put on all businesses uh, throughout the world. Yes, I love this wisdom. Yeah, one of my mentors said to me a while ago, he said, there's the economy and then there's your economy. It's the way that you think about it, you know? So, yeah, I think the big takeaway so far with you is that adaptation. And I love that you are a te walking testimony of the fact that, you know, you can adapt and make it work. So, yeah, some people just throw the towel in way too early, right? In your opinion, what do you feel is the most important leadership principles that have contributed to your success? And how can other aspiring leaders that are listening right now implement these in their own careers? I think there's a universal theme of all great leaders. And whether it's a political leader, uh, a military leader, business leader, a uh, religious leader. And that's basically all leaders uh, sell hope. Uh, they inspire people to think, there's a better way. If you look at something like, like Martin Luther King, uh, he wasn't espousing violence. 
he was basically nonviolent, but he was telling people, I have a dream where all of us will be really equal, just like the Constitution said it's supposed to be. And he was selling this dream to tens of millions of people. And by the way, it wasn't just black people or people of color. When you saw the marches and so on, it was white people who were outraged by the system and that they too had the dream that we could live side by side in peace and prosperity. Uh, if you look at the elections, uh, Obama, you know, just had one word for his campaign slogan, hope. Uh, Hillary was stronger with Hillary. Which one made a difference to the person that's going to be voting? Stronger with Hillary means nothing. It's selling <laughs> hope. Hope yeah. that you can do better. Your children will do better. Your parents will do better. Uh, if you look at Reagan, he said, make America great. And years later, Trump says, make America great again. They were all selling hope. And so in my case, I was selling the dream to real estate people that there is a better compensation method, that you can make more money without having to go out and start your own small company, be in business for yourself, but within an industry or a, an office where you weren't by yourself. And so we were selling the dream of more independence, more freedom, more income, and that dream worked out. Yeah. And were you running trainings and workshops a lot to just keep feeding the minds and hearts of your uh, staff? I was the number one trainer for the company for over 40 years. Um, in most of that time period, I traveled at least 200 days a year. And mostly it was doing seminars, training programs, anything from uh, personal promotion, advertising, time management, hiring an assistant, building a team. And uh, I was a very inexpensive keynote speaker. And so all it was, was the cost of travel and setting up the hotel rooms and that type of thing. So uh, I was the chief cheerleader of the company, uh, more so than a CEO or maybe a president. Mm, that makes a huge difference. Your people can see how much you actually love the vision and the mission of your company and the impact it's making. That's really cool. I like that a lot. And not a lot of uh, CEOs or founders of companies can even say that they could do that. You know, they end up hiring other people. So well done. That's amazing. And on that note then, because you did a lot of speaking, a lot of training, you're moving around, you you taught a lot. It sounds like you were like the Swiss army knife <laughs> of uh, different skill sets that you were teaching there. How do you prioritize your time and manage your workload as an entrepreneur? That's a big thing that people are struggling with right now. They're getting very distracted and very burnt out. So how do we better manage our time as entrepreneurs? Well, in the first place, there's no such thing as really achieving total balance in your life. There are going to be time periods when you have to work harder, and there's going to be time periods when you can take it a little bit easier. Um, I think the most important aspect of, of growing a company is setting your priorities correctly. When you're a one-person company and you're first getting started, you have more time than you have money, and you have the drive and the ambition. So if you have to work 18 hours a day, you can gut your way through it. Uh, you're the chief cook, bottle washer, janitor, every other position. But the minute that you can make your company profitable, uh, you need to hire talent that's better than yourself. And first thing to remember, by the way, is the team you start with is never going to be the team you end with. Uh, I made a mistake years ago, I think 38 years in real estate, I bragged I'd never lost an officer from my company that had voluntarily left the company. And so I was proud of that. I was wrong about it because there were many that we outgrew and they didn't keep up with the company and we let them tag along too long. So when you start talking about setting your priorities, number one, you have to focus on two or three simple things. Uh, I was at a seminar recently, a favorite mentor of mine, Darren Hardy, and he asked anybody, can you very succinctly, tell me in a sentence, what do you do? And my CEO was with me. We both put our hands up and because we both had, had said it simultaneously so many times. And it's basically, 
We sell franchises, we recruit and retain sales associates, and we collect the money. Now, that's a pretty simple deal. And you could get lost in the 100 services we do. But in reality, if you're a franchise company and you don't sell franchises, you don't expand. And if the franchises don't sell the product or recruit and retain the agents, you don't make money. And if you don't collect the money, you can't roll back in the company and invest in it and make the company far better and more profitable for the agents in it. And so you find a, a, a passion, a focus point, what's your product or service, what's unique about you, and then you build on your business from that. Always coming back to focus, 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 and never getting lost chasing the shiny thing. In the real estate industry, the last few years, technology has been the big tech word, and everybody's chasing software, the newest app, the newest this, the newest that. And in reality, the focus is, what kind of service are you giving your clients? If you're, if you're just giving outstanding, amazing service, they're going to send you customers. You don't have to go out and prospect. You build your business on referrals. And so the better you are at the craft that you're doing, the more likely it is you don't have to look for business. It will come to you. Mm, that's it. There's so much wisdom in there. I hope if anybody's listening to this right now that is looking at taking their business seriously, I hope you're taking notes right now too and you're putting them into action after this uh, this episode. So, Dave, if you were given one year to live, what would you do differently and why? I would do nothing differently. My mentor, Darren Hardy, gave me a very succinct uh, definition of success. And he said, I want to do what I want to do with who I want to do it, where I want to do it, and when I want to do it. And that is success. So life is too short to waste it on anything that doesn't fit into those things. I remember uh, somebody stating, uh, is Jim Rohn, said you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And that's because you're with them far more than anybody else, usually more than you are with your own family. And so you will pick up their work habits, their attitudes, uh, their desire for furthering themselves in life. If you surround yourself with uh, lower income people, let's say you're uneducated, you're honest, and you're a ditch digger. That's okay. I mean, there's a place in the world for ditch diggers. Not everybody can be a brain surgeon. Uh, the problem is, as a ditch digger, you're around other ditch diggers. And you will dress the same way, use the same language, cuss words. On Friday night, you'll go to the same neighborhood bar. you drink the same brands of beer. Uh, if you have time for vacation, it's usually going to be something... Uh, going to the lake or fishing at the river or going hunting or whatever it might be. And that's your lifestyle. You'll drive a similar truck. You'll wear similar clothes. If you are a cardiologist and you go to college for four years, medical school for three, residency for two, you do two years in a hospital someplace, bear in mind that almost everybody in the hospital that is working there has a college degree. And so you will be surrounded with well-educated people. Your peers are going to be other surgeons and cardiologists and medical practitioners who are doing extremely well. You will take the same vacations, whether it's to Aspen or Vail, or whether it's to the Swiss Alps. Uh, you'll have your kids that will go to good schools. You join the country club. You're, you're associating with other people who are high drive, high achievement individuals. And so you play up to your competition. You play better golf if you're playing with a better golfer. If you're just out with a, some friends and drinking beer and, and you just duffers and you're hitting the balls and that didn't go very well, drop another ball and hit another one. But if you're in a country club and you're in the tournaments and you have to follow the rules of the tournaments and everybody's serious about it and you still have a good time, but you just up your game 
when you're with other people who are serious about their game. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It does. Yeah, it has a massive impact on you. And uh, it affects our whole worldview, right? Sometimes some people just live in this little bubble. They don't see the broadness of the world. They don't think of the bigger picture as well. So this is really sound advice. I love this. We're taking this down the existential route. So I want to go a little bit deeper here. Let's have a look at this. If you could relive one day out of your life that you've already had from the past, which day would it be and why? Mm. I've had a lot of successes and a lot of failures. And usually it was not a one day thing. Uh, the failures come about because you've been doing something wrong for quite some time and it catches up with you. And the successes are the same thing. Uh, everybody looks at me and says, well, geez, you're an overnight success. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, you weren't alive 45 years ago when you were seeing how hard we were struggling. So it's kind of fun. Like, uh, uh, I think there are days that you remember forever. And the, I think the day that I will remember forever is that uh, I went to the hospital in very bad shape, uh, thought I had a herniated disc. My legs were paralyzed. And uh, we'd been putting off back surgery for a couple of years. I had a great surgeon. And he says, I don't want to cut on you unless I have to. Let's do some spinal shots. And so anyway, uh, I was in bad shape. I went in the hospital on a Sunday, and I thought, that's all right. I'll be okay. Sometime this week, they'll operate. I'll be in two or three days, then I'll rehab, and I'll go home. And as it happened, uh, an hour after I got to the hospital, I went into toxic shock. Uh, they rushed me into an ICU, put me on a ventilator, hooked me up to everything, and all of a sudden, uh, my organs all shut down, and I was in flat line two weeks later. Uh, they asked uh, everybody to put me into hospice. It was not possible for me to live. Wow. And a team of eight different doctors said the same thing. And uh, my family and my best friends said, nonsense, give him a chance. And they said, well, this is expensive. I said, we can afford it. Don't worry about it. And uh, three months later, I started coming out of the coma. And so at the time, I was a quadriplegic. I was totally fetal. I had shrunk into my body, all my ligaments, and everything had shortened and strengthened or tied into a knot. And the doctors, when I started talking to them, they, I asked him, what's my cognitive ability? And he says, well, it's about of a four or five-year-old. And the interesting day was about four months later after hard work, I asked him then again, well, where am I at? And he said, well, we've got you up to high school. And I said, that's great news because that, that's all there is. I failed out of college. So <laughs> this might be the best day of my life. I'm back to normal, sort of, except for I was still quadriplegic. And so that uh, I just had the drive and the ambition and determination when every person said, you're never going to walk again, that at first it was a pity party. And it was, God, that can't be true. Look at all the things I've accomplished in my life. And now I'm going to be stuck like this. And I thought about that 15 or 20 minutes, cried to myself, got angry and said, screw you. I'm going to walk out of this place. Well, I worked harder than anybody's ever worked. And uh, my therapist and uh, nurses pushed me really, really hard. I begged them to. I said, never let me give up. And uh, after months and months, I did not walk out of the hospital. I went home in an electric wheelchair. But I stayed in it for another year of working my butt off. And uh, the magic day came when I was able to start walking with braces and double crutches and then work my way to no braces, and then finally to a cane, and then finally to 10,000 steps a day. Uh, that was the achievement of a lifetime. Uh, when I went to my convention in January, I spoke from an electric wheelchair, told them the process and the lessons I had learned, which were all the lessons I had taught. They can grow rich, you set a goal step by step, put it in writing, get a mastermind group to support you. And I said, I've done all those things. 
and I've just made up my mind that uh, I'm never going to quit. And even if I don't really ever walk again, I'll be the best damn paraplegic you've ever seen in your life. And so on the stage, I told him I'd finally had managed to walk a few steps. At the end of the meeting, I got up and walked off the stage, and I made a commitment that by five months, I would walk 10,000 steps a day. And on Memorial Day of that year, I had gone to the golf course and walked a fairway and stopped and sat down, walked back the other way and tried not to take big hills. And Memorial Day, I did my 10,000 steps, which was, I'm back. Yes, Dave, God has his hand on you. <laughs> he knows you're willing to go out there in the world and do some pretty epic things. So <laughs> it's good to good to hear you bounce back. And uh, wow, that'd be pretty inspiring. Beautiful stuff. Awesome. What would you say then is your biggest risk that you took in your life? And what did you learn from it? I uh, had the opportunity to start driving NASCAR when I was in my 50s. Uh, Bill Marriott called me out of the blue and he said, Dave, you're one of our biggest customers of the company. Uh, you do whatever it is, 50,000, 70,000 room nights a year and all the conventions. And I'm taking a group of the good guys to, uh, uh, Bondurant, a racetrack in Mesa, Arizona, a road course. And it's a two day deal. You want to go? And I said, sure. And, uh, one day we did uh, souped up Mustangs, and the other day we did little Formula Vs, open open wheel. And by the end of the first day, I was beating all the professional drivers' times. <clears throat> Walked out and I very foolishly said, I'm not too old for this, older than anybody else that was driving at the time. And so knowing nothing about it, I went out, <clears throat> ordered a couple of cars be built down in Newtown, Alabama, uh, went to the local racetrack, started taking driving lessons, went all over the United States and ended up hitting the track. And uh, it was a blur. Uh, I didn't know how to set up my car. I didn't know how to get the right team. Uh, it took six months to figure it out. Then the six months, I said, I don't want to be a townie. I want to go on the tour. I want to go with the big boys. And I took the big step to do it. So I think one of the most difficult things I ever had to do in my life was I went from a three mile track to going down to test Daytona at 200 and some miles an hour and uh, restrict your plate. You never lift your foot off the accelerator. You just keep it dug in as far as it'll go. And you come down a mile long straight away, you come right into the turn. It's got a big bowl. And you start making the turn in your accelerator. Your brain is, you can do this. You can do this. Say, hey, dummy, let me up. Let me up. Made it through one lap. And the car held. I was terrified for one lap. And on the second lap, I knew all I had to do, turn the wheel, keep my foot in it. And I had conquered an incredible fear at the time. Within a year... I started driving the biggest, fastest tracks in the world, and it was like driving on a freeway. There's no longer any anxiety. There was no more fear about it. It was, this is normal. Just like when you get your first driving lesson, and maybe you got a stick, and you're stutter stepping, and you're thinking, oh, my God, how am I going to do that? And a year later, you're eating a sandwich, got your arm around your girlfriend, you're training, changing the radio stations and driving with one hand. And just, you know, it's so easy to do. And everybody looked at professional racing and thought, boy, they must have nerves of steel. Not at all. After you've, after you've wrecked four or five cars and your safety harness and your helmet and everything saves you, then it just becomes it's another day at the office. And it <laughs> just becomes fun. It's like I've told everybody, I never lost a single race. I just ran out of laps. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, it's all about turning your fear into fun, right? Yes. And you talked about fun. Being a celebrity, signing autographs, being treated so well every place you go, that's pretty cool. It happens to sports figures and 
politicians and, you know, other celebrities much more than it does to business owners. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some, some politicians might get the uh, <laughs> cake in the face too at times. <laughs> so, yeah, it com- comes with it, doesn't it? The good and the bad. Yeah. yeah. You know, when I was in uh, Western Australia, I was working. This was before I started my business. I used to work up in the deserts. And uh, I was catching snakes and lizards and kangaroos, right? I was working in the environmental team. And uh, when I first started snake handling, it scared the pants off me. Yep. But one thing that my teacher taught me, he said that your your knowledge must reach that level of fear. Once your knowledge matches your fear, it's not that the fear doesn't go away. It's that your knowledge surpasses it and your understanding and wisdom and experience goes beyond it. And then you can turn it into fun. Yes. So it sounds like that's what you did. It's like everything's new, but it, it, and I know there's something in your spirit as an entrepreneur where you want to conquer something so that that becomes normal. And then you go beyond that, right? That's what it sounds like you've done pretty much your whole life. If you look back in retrospect, it was just turning the scary into a normal and moving to the next thing. It's pretty cool. Fun. Yeah, that's it. If you could have dinner with anyone, Dead or alive, who would it be and what would you talk about? Oh, let's say John Wayne. John Wayne. All right. Um, when night. I was a boy, he was my idol. Uh, I wanted to be big and tough and strong and brave and whatever. Um, he had a fascinating life. And, uh, he was pretty much the person you saw on the screen. And I've made a big time effort to study everything I can about him just out of a interesting biography, I guess I would say. And so I think it'd be fascinating to talk to somebody like that. I did have dinner one night 20 some years ago with Sophia Loren. And uh, that was a rather remarkable night to me. Uh, she was, I don't know what her age was. I guess I can't say 60s or something. But she was as beautiful then as she was when she was a 24-year-old starlet. Mm, but uh, yeah. she had such an amazing life. And I asked her at the time, because I was a much younger man, and I said, well, what is it like to have had this stardom and had epic beauty and having millions of men swoon and think about you and whatever? And as you age, obviously – and if you live long enough, we're all going to age. And how have you adapted? And she smiled and she said, well, I, I like to treat myself like a fine wine. And that when you're a young fine wine, one of the best uh, bottles of the year, uh, you're vibrant and you're fruity and you're, you're much more uh, uh, robust, if you will. But over a period of time, really great wine ages well and it stays just as good. It just ages differently and it has a different, different type of uh, characteristic, if you will. And so she was very comfortable talking about, yes, God, those were the glory days, but I'm having more fun today than I did then. And I thought that insight really, uh, Push me forward in my life of understanding that this is the way it is. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's, aging is part of life if you live long enough. And can you accept it? And what can you do with it? Yeah, it sounds like a very important key to to hold if you want happiness, right, and fulfillment in your life is to not wish that you could have done something different or or be down upon yourself because of of your age but embracing that you are able to take all the wisdom with you that your value actually increases i have such a big respect for for those who have walked the path before me and it sounds like you've been around some pretty awesome people and that's great and and you've been able to do that for other people too i'd love to know with your book that you've written and it's coming out you know soon the book, by the way, for anyone that's listening, is The Perfect 10, 10 Leadership Principles to Achieve True Independence, Extreme Wealth, and Huge Success by David Liniger, Dave Liniger. Uh, Dave, 
what are you most excited about when it comes to this book? Is there a certain chapter in there or like a big highlight key point in there that you want people to really take home with them? Yeah, I would say that uh, I, I want to prove to people that you literally can have it all. And the name of a perfect 10 uh, really refers to gymnastics or to platform diving where you are sole participant. And when you walk out to give your performance, uh, it is totally up to you to do as flawless and perfect a job as you can and to achieve that day, which is almost never happens when every one of the judges at the end of your performance holds up tens all the way around, you might only accomplish that two or three times in your career. Well, the same thing is true in life and business, uh, personal relationships. Uh, the question is, how close to that can you get and still have a meaningful life? So for a while, like I have one of my best friends and he went back to school uh, to get his MBA. And so he sat with his family. He had three wonderful kids and beautiful wife. And they said, you know, we're going to make some sacrifices here. Um, it's going to take me 18 months. I still have to work for my living at Remax, And that's at least 2000 hours a year. I'm still a reserve cop in the police force. And that's 200 hours a year. And my studies are probably going to be close to a thousand hours a year. And so there's not going to be time for me to do the things that I've done and tried to be a good parent coming to the baseball games, the soccer games, the swim meets every Saturday. It's a sacrifice that we'll have to make, but the sacrifice will pay off in a much better job, a much higher income, much better lifestyle for all of us. And so we'll have to suffer through and, and balance it out the best we can. And we have to be patient to make that balance work. Well, that's, that's the same problem as starting a new business. Uh, there's never enough time. And if, if the business is struggling, you feel like, well, I've got to skip this part of my life. I've got to work on this. And so, yes, at times, life will be out of balance, but you keep, you keep building your, your uh, skill set that you can get closer and closer to a balanced life. Don't seek perfection. Seek continual improvement. Mm -hmm. The Kaizen concept of improvement. Improve 100 things 1% at a time, not one thing 100% improvement. And that's a, basically a, a concept taught by the United States, helping the Japanese recover from World War II. When I was a young man, uh, that would be back in the early 50s. Um, if you had anything that was a junk piece of toy, it was stamped on it, made in Japan. Well, by the time I was in high school, the Japanese had cleaned our clock, man. They were selling us our televisions, our radios, and our automobiles because their, their uh, quality had increased so dramatically over a decade. And the United States fell behind. We didn't take our own advice. And they did it merely by change 100 things, 1%, not one thing, 100%. And I think if that's any advice I can give to a small business is you got great goals. Uh, you're not going to achieve everything overnight. Just be thinking every day, how can I do this just a little bit better, a little bit less costly? And it works. Mm. I'd imagine it would create great harmony in your life, right? Because some people are just so singly focused on one dimension and they sacrifice having a good relationship with their children or their partner. Instead, they're the you know big top business guy or girl, but their health has been hit, you know? So I like this. I like what you're teaching. It's like you can have it all, just not all at once, right? You can build it over time. That's really cool. Yeah. That's yeah. a great statement. You can have it all, but usually not all at once. <laughs> yeah yeah it takes time for sure dave what is one thing that you want to be remembered for after you die and why um i'd like to be remembered for 
climbing a mountain and having the time to reach around and put my hand down and say, let me give you a lift up. Um, so many people in my life have given me a first, a second, and a third chance. And so many people in my life have reached out to me and said, have you tried this? Would you like to improve this way? How can I help you become more successful? And so everybody in the world learns simply by mimicking. Everybody thinks that you go to college and get a degree or you go to trade school and you become a union card holder. Uh, we mimic from the day we're born. Little babies don't know how to smile necessarily, but the parents standing over cooing and smiling and baby talking. And then all of a sudden the baby starts to smile. Every time a human smiles, baby smiles back. As the baby gets a little bit older, the hero worship the parents, the mom and the dad. I want to grow up big and strong like dad. I want to grow up and uh, be a beautiful woman like mom. And then by the time they get into grade school, they start mimicking each other. Then we get to the terrible teens and they really are terrible and they start mimicking each other and they're all trying to be independent. I don't want to be like my parents anymore. I want to be the cool guy in, in high school and in college you mimic and in adult life you mimic. Uh, if you own a company and if you're the boss and you got a great attitude and you come to the office, you dress well, uh, you work hard, you're kind to people, the people around you are going to act the same way. So even in the real estate business, it's normal in a lot of markets. We don't dress like we did 10 years ago. Thank God the tie has gone away and all that stuff. But I mean, if you're in, in New York or Chicago, you wore a coat and tie until five years ago. And if you're on the beaches of California, you bring you to shorts and a T-shirt. In both cases, they sell real estate. But they mimic the customers they're dealing with. So the most important thing is boss watching. If you are the boss or you're the supervisor, no one ever stops looking at you. They will watch everything you do. They might not comment it. They might not tell you they're doing it. But trust me, they will imitate your behavior. And if your behavior is total professionalism, being a kind person, helping out other people, encouraging people, you'll develop that culture. If you're a jerk, jerks will join your company because they want to be in company of their own. This is the mirror of leadership, isn't it? Yes. Which actually circles back around to that important statement you made about it. it I, I believe your association determines your destination, who you associate with. You got to be careful who's in your friendship circles, right? Because you start acting like them as well without even knowing it. It's a very unconscious act at times. So, Dave, this is amazing. I've really loved this conversation. I can't wait for everybody to hear this. Uh, if you're listening right now, I want you to go grab that book as well when it comes out. Where can we find you online? Do you have any workshops online, any podcasts or, or anything happening online that you'd like to share? Yeah, uh, you can go to uh, DaveLeniger.com. Uh, I've got uh, a podcast that uh, has some rather interesting people on it. Uh, it's called uh, Grit and Ambition. And it's uh, all about people who really start with nothing. And they have ambition, determination, and grit. And that they've made something fabulous of their life. And whether it's in business or if it can be in music or arts or it can be in uh, charitable work. Uh, success isn't limited to just being a business person. And so uh, listening to what other people face, the challenges they overcome, encourages you to think, well, if all those people can do that, so can I do that. And we're around so many naysayers out there that are talking about, oh, it's just too tough, or the economy's bad, or the interest rates are too high, or whatever it is. I, I didn't get a college education and so I can't go anywhere. That's nonsense. We live in the United States, I think, in one of the greatest countries in the world. We have our problems, so does every other country have their problems. But no country gives as much uh, opportunity to take yourself as far as you are capable of going. Mm, that's such a gift. 
such a gift that you you can't let go to waste for sure. Dave, last question we end every interview with. This is a question here. If you were to deliver your last 30 second speech to the world, what would that last 30 seconds sound like? Well, to frame it for you, uh, I was giving this speech at the convention and well-respected uh, company had been 40 years old at that time, maybe 39. Uh, everybody had seen me healthy and everything. And now they see me do a one hour presentation in my wheelchair, electric wheelchair. And in 30 seconds, I totally changed their world. And I said, we're friends here. I want to ask to do one thing for me, please. And everybody's really quiet. I said, please stand up. And they all stood up. And I said, you understand how wealthy I am. I would give every dollar of my life today to be able to do what you just did. And the room was just went crazy. It was just like, that's what, that's what real wealth is. The ability to do something that you want to do. And there are those people, I'm fortunate when I managed to figure out how to walk again. Uh, but there are those people that will never walk again. And so you think you have a bad day. <laughs> Most important thing to remember, you're still shiny side up, man. You're still breathing and you can do anything if you got your health.